morning. My name is Dave Amron, and uh, Bob asked me to talk about the impacts of uh, Sandy on the natural resources of Gateway. Um, but I've decided since I can't, since it's a little early for us to judge the impact on the natural resources of Gateway, uh, I'm expanding the, uh, the talk. I made a decision to expand the talk to talk about not only the natural resources of Gateway, but the cultural resources and recreational resources. So for folks who uh, are familiar with uh, Gateway National Recreation Area, it's a national park site um, in uh, New York City. Um, it's in green in this map. And you can see it's at the mouth of New York Harbor, and uh, it includes Jamaica Bay, parts of the Rockaways, parts of Staten Island, and um, also Sandy Hook in New Jersey. And if you been watching your news in the last month, you probably uh, know that uh, Gateway is surrounded by some of the most hardest hit communities, um, the Rockaways and also, oops, sorry, um, Staten Island shoreline, Inland Beach, South Beach area, and also the Rockaways. So in Jamaica Bay, we had um, Fort Tilden, the beach clubs, and Jacob Reese Park were very hard hit by the storm. Twelve employees, families uh, who lived in the park were displaced. And uh, some of the employees that lived in the Rockaways and in uh, Staten Island were displaced by the storm. Floyd Bennett Field is now a major staging area. One. Uh, benefit of the fact that Gateway existed in those large areas and there was a lot of open space, and you'll see pictures a little bit later, is that uh, Gateway was able to be a, a really good partner and a really good location for um, emergency, rest, emergency response to take place. And uh, currently the wildlife refuge and a few other places have uh, reopened, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, reopening to the uh, public because as a national park site, one of the things that we believe are, are the, some of the greatest things that we can do for the public post-Sandy is to try to reopen parts of Gateway as soon as we possibly can so that people can come out and kind of get away from their, uh, from their concerns, particularly in, people, in areas that were most hardest hit. So some of, the, uh, some of the visual impacts that are, uh, are pretty amazing is uh, if you're familiar with the, uh, the Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge, you'll know that there's an east and a west pond, and both the east and the west pond were breached by the impacts of the storm. And this is prior prior to the storm. This is the uh, this is a not quite freshwater impoundment, but semi freshwater impoundment. And if you look on this picture, there was a uh, breach. So the west pond has essentially become part of Jamaica Bay at this point in time. Jacob Reese's bathhouse. If anybody has uh, visited uh, Jama uh, Reece, Jacob Reese Park, you'll know that there is a was it was a beautiful old Art Deco bathhouse that was constructed prior to the Robert Moses era. So it's probably or this is a vintage something like 1930s, late 1930s, early 1940s, and a storm surge came directly through the bathhouse. And this is a, the old courtyard, and all the walls were taken down. Uh, I mentioned the fact that we are uh, we have large open space. This is a 9,000 car parking lot in um, in the Rockaways, and uh, it's estimated and it has been used as a location for debris removal, debris relocation, temporary storage, and removal became a really important aspect of the storm, particularly in the hardest hit, most hardest hit neighborhoods. And the uh, parking lot of Jacob Reese Park became the recipient of uh, most of the trash that was collected in the Rockaways and also at Breezy Point. And we don't have a total count as to the uh, estimate of the amount of trash that was, <clears throat> that was brought to uh, Reese Park, but uh, a guesstimate by the Army Corps, who actually is is running this uh, trash disposal uh, site is approximately one million cubic yards of trash will ultimately 
have passed through here. Floyd Bennett Field is New York City's first municipal airport. Lots of miles of runways. Became a uh, really important um, recovery site. This is a, a field of ambulances and trucks with water. Um, National Guard troops encamped there. Uh, up to about 5,000 folks were, were literally living on Floyd Bennett Field at one point in time and many of them still uh, still in there. Uh, the, this is the Rockaway Peninsula, and just to give you a sense of uh, the overwash and the impact of the overwash, this is, um, this is Fort Tilden. If you're familiar with Shore Road in Fort Tilden, this is Shore Road and the Fisherman's Parking Lot. Uh, this whole Shore Road is, uh, no longer exists. Been totally, been totally washed away, and uh, we've been talking about adaptation on our in our coastal areas. There's another, uh, there's another um, aspect to how the National Park Service intends to respond to this, and that's retreat. So we don't, we do not expect. Uh, we don't expect to rebuild this this road, and uh, we probably are going to think twice about restoring the bathhouse at Jacob East Park because we don't want to reconstruct things in areas where the expectation is that a year, two years, three years from now, we'll have the same exact problem that we had. So as we move forward towards restoration, we're thinking uh, not only adaptation, but we're also thinking retreat. Right? And in the case of Fort Tilden, um, that might be a that might be a really uh, wise move there. Uh, Plum Beach. Uh, many folks in this room have been involved for a number of years in uh, in the uh, Plum Beach critical zone area, and um, that is a location that is that abuts the Bell Parkway, and as a result of Hurricane Irene, I believe um, the uh, the escarpment that exists there came within something like 20 feet. Of impacting the Belt Parkway, and the, the Corps, New York City Parks, the Park Service, and other agencies work really fast to get a contract in place to try to um, mitigate the potential impacts of of a uh, of the Belt of losing the Belt Parkway actually, and uh, and about three or four weeks prior to um, Sandy. Finally, had a contract in place, and approximately two, I believe it was something like 170,000 cubic yards of sand were placed on Plum Beach. Um, the job was not complete prior to the hurricane actually hitting uh, the area, and a bunch of us were biting our nails for a long time, thinking, after all this time, here, here we were, we had the sand in place. Was it all going to get washed away by Sandy? And in fact, it did not. Just because of the way wind, the wind directions were or whatnot, it had very little impact on, on that. Uh, Sandy Hook. Sandy Hook, if you visit Sandy Hook, uh, most, of, most of the buildings there are important cultural resources. Um, lots of building damage. The sewer system and freshwater system doesn't operate anymore and may not operate for months. And we are re, we are hoping to, uh, to reopen on Memorial Day. And that's going to be a big push. And we certainly are not going to open the same park on Memorial Day that we would have opened up uh, you know, pre-Sandy, but we're going to, you know, we, uh, we fully intend to have some type of opening on Memorial Day and right now. Um, this is what Sandy Hook looks like. If you've uh, been down there, there's a, there's a beautiful uh, multiple use trail that we lost sections of at this point in time. <coughs> this is what our, our maintenance area looked like uh, shortly after Sandy. Staten Island, Miller Field is a, uh, is one that was surrounded by some of the most devastated parts of the South Shore of Staten Island, Midland Beach, South Beach. Uh, they also, in addition to Floyd Bennett Field, were used as uh, areas where 
restoration activities took place. FEMA still has a uh, has activities there, and some relocate some some uh, companies that are working on restoring housing units in in uh, New York and Midland Beach and South Beach are in that location. And I am just about out of time, and we're hoping that uh, we. we some parts of Great Hills have been reopened, and this is a before and after. There's a marina in Great Hills. The top is before, the bottom is after. Um, this is what some of the shorelines look like, and we do have lots of uh, remaining work to do. We were talking about natural resource impacts to begin, and we have assessed a whole bunch of natural resource impacts, but we have we have a ways to go to really determine what the overall impact of the storm is. I could say at first glance, it looks like the marshes that have been restored in Jamaica Bay fared very well. Um, we've had the Army Corps folks have been out there, uh, researchers have been out there, and, and it appears as though uh, our efforts um, have not been um, destroyed. Um, we are going to be working with some of the folks in this room on uh, hazardous waste and, and spill uh, assessments. And we still don't know what the overall impact is on wildlife populations. We expect it to be somewhat minor. It'll be different, okay? But it's the nature of uh, natural areas that they change and uh, habitat. And um, as long as they are more or less natural events, like a like a storm coming through, uh, wildlife can mostly uh, adapt to those types of changes. And then uh, we're, we still are trying to figure out how we're going to deal with the breach in the east and west pond, whether that whether we are just going to adapt and retreat from it, or whether we're going to actively uh, manage that area and site. And uh, thank you for your time. Happy holidays.